Howard, you've got a new book coming out, and I'm thinking with all that's going on with, in China and tensions in the region, what are the things about the past that you deal with in the book that you think is crucial to keep in mind as we're trying to make sense of what's going on? So my book, which is called Everything Under the Heavens, um, is about the history of China's um, self-image and um, self-conception in terms of a geopolitical power. And since for most of China's history, being a ge geopolitical power meant essentially in nearby Asia, um, the book is really about how China has um, engaged uh, with other countries. They weren't known as countries throughout most of the past. They, China was an empire, and to one degree or another, China conceived of these other entities as subjects of China. Um, and this sets in to place a, a very specific kind of mindset that endures down to the, to the very present. And this arises in the most recent news, of course, with um, locking horns with the United States over Trump's provocative statements about Taiwan. China brings this same um, imperial mindset to the question of Taiwan, which uh, is not always um, very accurately based on history, but stems from a, a sense of, of China's own centrality and, and even rights to possession of various bits and pieces of, of the surrounding world. Um, the, the, the sort of less obvious piece of an answer to your question, though, has to do with the United States. So my book is nominally really about China and about Chinese power, but um, China was not really aware of being a Pacific power until the United States emerged as a big player in the Pacific, beginning with American colonization of the Philippines, which most people, Americans, are completely unaware of um, as we speak. Um, and um, uh, this American eruption into East Asia uh, via the Pacific Ocean is even probably the most immediate or proximate cause of any Chinese, present-day Chinese conception of what it means to be an Asian, because it was in contradistinction to these, for the first time via the Pacific, very obviously non-Asian peoples, that a concept of Asian-ness arose for, for China. So so those are the kind of first two things I would say as, a, as an attempted way of addressing your question. So in the Oxford Illustrated History of Modern China, which I edited, there are chapters that deal with some of those same kinds of phenomenon, and I, I think particularly of both, both the colonization of the Philippines but also the Boxer moment, mm -hmm. when American troops for the first time are part of an international force on Chinese soil in the invasion by the eight Allied armies that suppressed that uprising. But the other thing I'm thinking about historically when we think about the volatility of this particular moment of tensions is the specific history of the Chinese Communist Party and the stories that the Communist Party has told since 1949 to justify their rule. And they've told a series of stories. One of the stories has always been that only under the Chinese Communist Party was China able to regain its kind of territorial integrity and start approaching the kind of control by a unified state of something similar to the borders of the Qing in its, hey in its heyday. But they also told other stories. They told stories about making China a place of more social equality, more equality, knew that all differences between wealth and poverty were going to disappear. Now that story no longer holds water. Uh, China has an incredibly high Gini uh, disproportion between wealth and, and poverty. They told a story about how their um, cadres and officials would not be corrupt like the Nationalist Party was, where they'd be people of moral virtue. And that also doesn't really hold much water with uh, many people within China. And the fact that Xi Jinping has made uh, an anti-corruption drive, such a signature move, speaks to the fact that there is this kind of waning of that story. So then what are they left with? They're left with a story about with some more recent path, a more recent creation, which is only under our watch has China had this great economic boom that's returning it to global centrality. And only under our watch is China at the center of global processes and institutions. So what happens right now um, is that the stories about expanding or regaining territory have become very important as legitimating stories, more important than ever to legit as legitimating stories, as some of the other stories have waned. 
And also there's that new pride in the central role in global institutions. And in some ways, the Trump um, presidency to be offers the possibility for, has already offered the possibility of, a, of an even greater role in global processes with the re possible retreat of the US from climate change organizations and so forth. But there's also the tension possibility now over a more assertive uh, American presence in um, island disputes and things. In the most recent um, first tweets and then statements on television shows of trying to somehow make the one uh, China policy a bargaining chip if to use in both economic uh, issues and uh, regarding things like the South China Sea. So that's a very volatile thing when you have um, the way in which Xi Jinping has staked his legitimacy on he needs to keep at least some degree of economic growth. And if there are economic tensions between the countries, that could challenge that. And also, he's taking great pride in this kind of nationalism. At the same time that um, Trump has to be seen as a nationalist, muscu they're both muscular nationalists of a sort. Mm -hmm. And muscular, muscular nationalists defining the same area as terrain is uh, as a combustible situation. Sure. As I listen to you explain the um, the story that the Communist Party has told um, over the years to, to sort of legitimize itself in the eyes of the people, I was really struck by uh, the extent to which uh, most of the strands of the story, as I heard you you lay them out, are Western stories of. A, a modern nation state with borders. That's a Western concept. That's not a Chinese concept. China throughout its its long um, dynastic history was, of course, an empire. And empires don't have fixed borders, by definition. Um, uh, some of the aspects of modern g um, domestic governance that you described, some of the m ways of measurement of one's own success and legitimacy in terms of economic returns and of lifting people out of poverty, of course, um, uh, you rightly laid your finger on the contradiction between the one thing that China boasts about, having lifted large numbers of people out of poverty, having lifted, quote unquote, large numbers of people out of poverty, as it constantly reminds us, but also having simultaneously um, presided over um, a huge boom in inequality, kind of unprecedented on a global scale inequality. Um, <coughs> the challenge to me uh, that seems most striking right now is f for the Chinese is finding a way, it is true that they want to be part of global governance, which is another thing that you mentioned, but the challenge that, that, that lies before Xi Jinping and his successors is finding some kind of story that isn't simply a universal story, that isn't an inherited story, that it isn't a hand-me-down story of institutions or modes that that were invented elsewhere or imposed by others or, or um, became commonplace by the agency of Western powers, but to find some kind of unique Chinese story. Because I think from the perspective of the Chinese leadership, only uniquely Chinese stories can provide lasting um, and deep legitimacy for them. China, uh, the system, the state, the Communist Party constantly emphasize um, the importance of being true to Chineseness. And, but under the Communist Party, there's been very little reinvention of what it means to be Chinese in any kind of more than superficial way. And so this is to come back to your point about the two um, alpha males or you know, aggressive, um, you know, assertive characters who seem to be at the helm of these two countries, if it is true, and I think it's really way too early to, kn to know uh, what uh, this very unpredictable character called Trump is going to do in, in, in Asia, but if it is true, that he is prepared to dilute um, American alliances in the region, and he's prepared to withdraw um, dramatically from various other instances of global governance, then this does, I think, provide breathing room or space for the Chinese leadership to, for the first time, I think, in the communist era, to try to reinvent some of the ways and workings of the global system, at least within their immediate neighborhood. because either willfully or by accident, the United States under this kind of Trump leadership will have its attention turned elsewhere. 
Yeah, and I think it's clear that there's the desire to create a distinctively Chinese story, and Xi Jinping and his immediate predecessors have tried to tap into and use certain elements of the past, from starting with the Confucius Institutes to more recently the One Belt, One Road notion, or an effort to do that. Mm -hmm. But I do think they're, they're superficial, and mm -hmm. they don't seem to have the kind of depth that actually some of the efforts to reimagine what a Chineseness uh, for the modern world that would not be simply a replica or an imitation of the West in around the turn of the, the previous century. Mm -hmm. There was a lot of creative thinking there, and I think um, there's the potential for it again, but the Communist Party style of authoritarianism is a, is a check on that. So instead you get something that, to bring in another muscular nationalist on the stage now, may look more like what Putin does with his nods to a kind of Russian uh, tradition there. Right. Um, I don't, I'm so far rather unprepared to imagine um, something truly original in terms of um, either statecraft or ideology from, from the Chinese Communist Party. Um, I think that the will is there, the desire is there, but um, the difficulty of coming up with something new um, uh, in um, the wake of a 20th century that tried a, such a wide range of ideological approaches um, is truly daunting. And nationalism is obviously not new. And that's the sort of one thing that they've pushed heavily on. And there's nothing really to complement it that would give this the, any kind of, um, uh, s that w would help this rise above the ordinary and to become something truly unique and special and, and, and to repeat myself new. Yeah, and one of the themes in the, the when I was struggling to try to how to introduce this um, illustrated history, a few pages, the thing I stressed was to think about Chinese tradition as multi-stranded, which is something that I think is you know, common within mm -hmm. uh, academic or scholarly circles, but and even in in the be and definitely in the best journalistic writing on China, but is missed a lot, mm -hmm. both in inside the Chinese government when it projects something like. Confucius Institutes, which suggest a, a single strand going back thousands of years, but rather to think of these multiple strands. I think that's to figure out a way to make more space in the story for thinking of uh, things. There was a moment in the late 1980s when this was really on the table um, with the movie uh, River Elegy, the sure. documentary right before the Tiananmen moment. Unimaginable today. Yeah, and unimaginable that that would be shown and right. part of a debate. Uh, but well, that's well, clearly what China needs. You should maybe describe very briefly what River Elegy was. Well, River Elegy brought up the idea that there were at least a couple of different strands, a sort of yellow strand and a blue strand. And the yellow strand, a kind of heartland, something associated with what we would now think of simplistically as Confucianism and um, tradition and hierarchy. And then a blue strand, which was openness to the wider world. Mm -hmm. And um, this was something that that you can think of, I think, uh, intellectuals from the early 20th century and the 1980s that were trying to figure out what this kind of configuration would mean. Mm -hmm. Another idea Lu Xun had in the early 20th century talked about the value of what's usually translated as grabism, which is self-confidently using the best, making a kind of hybridity out of choosing from multiple, multiple traditions, rather not, not looking for one foreign, Thing to, to model and not getting obsessed with staying a kind of unchanging um, indigenous tradition, but, but thinking self-confidently of mixing and matching from different, different elements. And I don't see that, I mean, ironically, I see that sometimes now in social movements in Taiwan mm -hmm. and in social movements in Hong Kong, at least in that flourishing of the umbrella movement, where even though it was in some ways rejecting Chineseness, it was actually rejecting a particular rigid form of Chineseness mm -hmm. that was a Beijing form of Chineseness and trying to imagine something different. But it's hard to see that on the mainland right now. So this is in many ways a self-imposed dilemma, self-imposed by the Communist Party on itself and upon the country, um, in insisting that whatever path China takes uh, must be a truly Chinese path. That it can't be derivative, it can't be inherited, it can't be, um, you know, some kind of um, 
latter day adhesion to somebody else's movement. Um, but is there such a thing? Is there anything? Is it possible to have a truly national path in today's world? Never mind Chinese for that matter. I mean, is there such a thing as a true French way, or a true German way, or a true Brazilian way, or a true Chinese way? And I think part of the answer to that question, and I think the, the listener will sense perhaps in my tone, my skepticism, but I think a part of the answer to the question lies in what's happened since river elegy. So China has attempted a couple of things that are, are I think, intended to smack of true Chineseness and of true, you know, of striking it out on one's own road, right? And you mentioned two of them, I think, very important examples, uh, Confucius Institutes and One Belt, One Road. Well, Confucius Institutes, in fact, don't have much to do with Confucius. Confucius Institutes are language programs of varying success that the Chinese have built around the world that don't resemble anything so much as Alliance Francaise and the Goethe Institute, et cetera, et cetera. And the reason why the Chinese Communist Party has not pushed the Confucius element is because they haven't even figured out how to push the Confucius element at home in China, never mind setting themselves up at universities all over the world and blending this soft power via language with some kind of vague, supposedly, you know, updated ancient philosophy called Confucianism, which also, which, by the way, is, is also isn't just one thing, right? One belt, one road. Okay, so it sounds nice, right? I mean, China, there's this fabulous tale about the Silk Road and its place in history and, you know, uniting East and West, et cetera, et cetera. But most of what we know so far about one belt road is old projects. Um, picking up on pre-existing trends and tendencies in the Chinese economy, most particularly the um, superabundance of domestic uh, capacity in terms of construction and infrastructure in China and the need, as with steel and other kinds of hard inputs, to export this excess capacity to other parts of the world. So this is kind of a, <coughs> a kind of um, uh, catch, uh, sort of a, a catch-all program to, to, to absorb excesses. It's kind of a, um, a remedy built after the fact as opposed to uh, some kind of fresh conception about it, some new thing that can be built or come into creation. Um, <clears throat> and what I think all this points to is the, the difficulty I alluded to earlier to come up with fresh ideas. Most of what China is doing is not involves no fresh thinking. And this is not a criticism of China. It's hard to be a fresh thinker in today's nation-state age, right? So what is China doing in the world? It's building a space program that is following the footsteps of our space program for the most part from 30, 40, 50 years ago. Um, and it's pursuing other kinds of hard and increasingly, but still at a fairly low level, soft power gambits that the United States and other nation states have employed in the past. And you have to search very hard to find anything that stands any chance of standing out over time as truly Chinese or unique to China, never mind ideo ideologically innovative. And I guess I'd just add that there is, there are some missed opportunities in thinking about soft power, because if you think about, and this, there's no way I can say how this would translate into a kind of grander strategy, but the maybe there's a way in which soft power drives and the failures of them kind of are a metaphor. China would love to create a world-class respected film industry. Mm -hmm. By squeezing Hong Kong, they're choking off the place that did manage to produce something that was related to Hollywood but genuinely new and was being copied in other places mm -hmm. in the Hong Kong cinema. And just if you think about then the the inability to even let that that degree of a space of creativity where it could be a kind of um, an airlock between right. China and the West where there could be new kinds of things coming out and now the the less tolerance for that shows while the dilemma is partly self, it is largely self-made there has been enough material success that I think um, the Communist Party at one level feels on a roll, while another level still feeling somewhat insecure and skittish about any challenges to it. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't feel as much need as it might have earlier to allow spaces for experimentation. 
even those spaces for experimentation are the best chance for the solutions to this very challenging dilemma. Could lie. Sure. So when I hear the word airlock, the first word that comes to mind is escape. Um, an airlock is supposed to keep things airtight, but of course it doesn't always work that way. And so I like the concept of Hong Kong as an airlock, but this is, gets to what's made China so nervous. That yeah, yeah. Hong Kong, by being granted this role as an airlock, has looked from the insecure perspective of Beijing recently as being kind of dangerously close to kind of escaping. Escaping from what? Escaping from orbit. Escaping out of control. Um, and so uh, I think this really reveals um, a very telling depth of, uh, of basic insecurity and of lack of confidence in one's own system and in one's own ability to, to continually reinvent in pace with the needs of the times. Um, and the result is, as I think you very aptly said, that you know, China, because it's so nervous, because it is you know, so rigid about such things, will, you know, risks killing the, the very aspects of its own system that offered it the greatest chance of coming up with the new sorts of modes and devices and means that it needs in order to, to evolve. Uh, I want to switch our conversation, though, in the direction of the United States, because if it's true that China has to reinvent itself, and it's having trouble reinventing itself, and I say that sympathetically, because as I said, it's not easy to reinvent, and for no one is it easy to reinvent oneself. Um, what are the possibilities that you can imagine for the United States to reinvent its role in East Asia? I mean, Trump. This was this was kind of one of the unexpected wild cards of the campaign. I don't think anyone saw this coming. Where, you know, a major party candidate would say that the big alliances that we've sustained in East Asia are not so important to us, and that the you know to sort of devalue those partnerships and to call into question their worth and their cost basis, et cetera, et cetera, as brutally as Trump has done. What are the alternatives? Yeah, that's that's a big. That's a big question. And while it did come out of nowhere, I mean, I think, I think with the the area of, area of, area of policy, I'm not I'm, I'm not used to thinking in those terms. Sure. But I guess the starting point would be a more realistic coming to terms with the history of our engagement there. Well, so my question to you really was not. I didn't mean to put you on the spot. Policy wise, it was as a historian. Yeah. How often have we seen the hinge kind of flap so quickly? Yeah. Where basically we're from one day. We were living with a totally settled conventional wisdom about some very important things to the next when all of a sudden major questions of global relationships are, are, are put onto the front burner in, in totally unexpected ways. Yeah, it's very rare. It's very rare to have that. And this is one way in which, while there's a lot of talk now that historians will look back at Donald Trump's victory as the turning point moment, for me, in some ways, when it comes to the relations in the Pacific, it was almost as big a turning point moment during the campaign, when in part because of what was being said on the campaign trail, Duterte went to Beijing. Mm -hmm. That was a kind of dramatic shift that upended uh, decades of just assumptions about what you, could, what you could count on as a kind of a fixed relationship. Mm -hmm. So I think we're, we're seeing, we may look back I think we'll. I think, to the extent we can imagine, what historians looking back at this moment in history will be. I think they that the the Trump victory will be a very big turning mm -hmm. point. But there'll be, with time, we'll think of a variety of other ones. Some intrinsic to Asia, not so much related to us. Modi's victory in India, and so forth. But on up until include and including that um, that moment involving the Philippines and Beijing. Sure, but you know, just to remind the viewer that Duterte's visit was not just surprising in the narrow way you suggested, but also was coming on the very heels of, of what looked at the moment like an incredibly big legal victory. Right, right. So the Philippines is coming out of this <laughs> incredible court case, having kind of won across the board. Yeah. And now Beijing's on the, on the spot, right? Its legitimacy is going to be called into question. It's got its back to the wall. What can it do? 
And next thing you know, Duterte is in Beijing, basically yeah. kissing up to the Chinese and telling Obama that his mother is a whore. Um, I mean, this is really talking about the swing of a hinge. Um, every bit as surprising as Trump, and every bit as unanticipated. No, it's a good example of how the moments that we love as historians, when things are being shaken up, and I really think 1900 was the kind of year when things were being shaken up, around 1898 to 1900, 1901, all kinds of things that we would eventually get used to, mm -hmm. or to some extent, including an international army involving people from many different parts of the world, rather than just parts of Europe, being on, on Chinese soil. Boxer, that was that was quite scene. something. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that suppression of the boxers, mm -hmm. the first, you know, an international peacekeeping force of that. Mm -hmm. And in fact, an international peacekeeping force that then went somewhat berserk, which is something we sort of would see often later in the 20th century. And the U.S. deciding to McKinley, you know, allegedly just through a sort of momentary thing, we need an empire. Mm -hmm going in a, in a different direction. All those things, in retrospect, it's a fascinating moment to revisit. It's an exciting one as a historian. But living through one, not so much. Wait, what was that saying about interesting times? Yes, I think that's, uh, <laughs> that's been on a lot of people's minds lately. Right.